from Community Public Radio, this is the CPR News. From New York, I'm Don DeBar. Russia's President Vladimir Putin spoke before the assembled collegium of the Russian Foreign Ministry on Thursday. He detailed some of the foreign policy challenges presented to Russia by the United States and the EU. He spoke following a short introduction from Russia's Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, and we bring you that in its entirety. Mr. Putin... Colleagues, we are glad that we have been able to organize the meeting of the Foreign Ministry Board we had to delay it last year. And I would like to, to welcome to this audience the representatives of the government, the Presidential Executive Office, and representatives of other institutions we always work together because this is the only way we can achieve meaningful results in delivering on the objectives that we have ensuring sustainable development improving the well-being of our citizens and promoting russia's standing on the international stage and i will have the honor and privilege to give the floor to president vladimir putin mr lavrov colleagues my greetings to all the participants in the extending meeting of the foreign ministry board today's agenda is about russia's foreign policy priorities and objectives for the future, taking into consideration the amendments to the Constitution that touch upon foreign policy, among other things. Our Constitution now sets forth a number of very important principles, like respecting the culture, the history of our ancestors, everything that brings our nation together around our common ideals and positions Russia as a peace-loving state and a proactive member of the international community. Specific efforts on the foreign diplomacy front will be reflected in the new version of the Russian foreign policy concept along with the national security strategy that was approved last summer will provide a roadmap for the foreign ministry and other agencies. It is essential that our foreign policy is designed for providing a secure environment for Russia's development, enabling Russia to deliver on its social and economic objective and improve the well-being of our people. And in this regard, Russia seeks constructive partner like um, relations with its partners and international structures we will contribute to international efforts to counter international threats like terrorism and cross-border crime, the proliferation of WMOs, climate change, and the degradation of the environment. As a permanent member of the UN Security Council, Russia will further stand up for the principles set forth in the UN Charter, sovereignty and equality of states, non-interference in domestic affairs, and fair resolution of their disputes and of course the United Nations plays a key role in international affairs and in this regard we want to convene a summit of the heads of state of the P5 countries that are in charge of international stability and security the coronavirus pandemic dear colleagues I have to mention this there is no getting away of this of course it disrupted life around the world last year as the minister has mentioned this we could not get together to have our traditional meeting with the ambassador ambassadors and permanent representatives of Russia. We had to work in a new environment. But what I want to say in this regard, despite all the measures 
that are being taken. We are far from defeating this pandemic. There are threats of new strains and we cannot isolate ourselves within a single country. For this reason, Russia calls for working together on an equal and fair footing to defeat this virus. Otherwise, this would be impossible. Recently, at the G20 summit, I proposed discussing mutual recognition of vaccine certificates uh, and I called on our partners to move forward on this quickly which is essential for restoring tourism and for returning to normal life and in this regard the WHO has a major role we need to support its activity in every possible way. It could be even more proactive in promoting mass vaccinations and accelerate the pre-qualification of vaccines, assessing their quality, effectiveness and safety. Climate change is also becoming an increasingly urgent issue and Russia contributes to resolving this issue with nuclear, with natural gas and with the sequestration potential of our forests. Russia is one of the leaders in fighting climate change. We comply with all the commitments. We have under the Paris agreements. Recently, we made a very important decision to carry out a new program, the program to improve the energy efficiency of our economy. This is just the first step. This program pursues a very ambitious agenda to reach carbon neutrality until 2050. Our diplomacy must be more proactive in countering EU's and the efforts by the United States to take leadership in this sphere. We see all the challenges uh, that took place in Glasgow during climate change negotiations. We call for finding mutually acceptable solutions in this regard. Overall, we have to proceed from the premise that Russia is a leading power in terms of the green transformation. Other priorities for the Russian diplomacy is the need to pay more attention to work more closely with our compatriots, defend the interests. And also we need to streamline procedures for granting Russian citizenship to our compatriots living abroad. Of course, we need to work on this. There are many challenges, but we can deliver on them. We need to harness the creative potential of the millions strong Russian diaspora. We need to promote security and cooperation in the post-Soviet space. This includes working within the CIS with countries with whom we have cultural ties and historical ties. The Eurasian Economic Union is very much important for uh, the ensuring mobility of services, goods, uh, labor and capital. We need to facilitate economic growth and do everything to improve the well-being of our people. We need to draw new members into the Eurasian Economic Union and considering the challenges we face along our borders, it is essential that we make a high priority out of working with our partners within the CSTO. This cooperation has made a major contribution in ensuring stability across the Eurasian states. It is essential that our cooperation with the, the CSTO serves as a shield for national interest, sovereignty and independence of the CSTO member states. We need to reinforce our cooperation within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The SCO is one of the most influential centers of the multipolar 
international structure. It helps ensure stability and sustainable social and economic development across Eurasia. It is in our interest that the SCO countries coordinate the foreign policy activity within the United Nations and within other international frameworks. Along the same lines, we will develop cooperation within BRICS, an association of states that covers more than 40% of the world's population and more than one-fourth of the land territory. BRICS must play a more proactive role in the world in line with the potential of the countries that make up this association. Colleagues, our diplomacy has been traditionally involved in promoting settlement in the regional conflicts. Unfortunately, there are more and more conflicts of this kind that require even more attention and prompt response. And this, of course, includes the crisis in Ukraine, the internal Ukrainian crisis. It is far from over. Ukraine does not deliver on its commitments. According to our partners in the Normandy Forum in Germany and France, they still stick to their commitments in the Normandy Forum, and, uh, and the Minsk agreements have become international law. The UN Security Council has adopted a decision to this effect, but in fact, uh, Germany and France encourage uh, Kyiv in dismantling these agreements, and this leads the negotiations into an impasse. Uh, working in the Normandy format must continue because there are no other mechanism for promoting settlement in Ukraine do not exist. There is no other alternative to the Minsk agreements. We need to take into consideration that our Western partners supply lethal weapons to Ukraine, which further escalates the situation. They undertake maneuvers in the Black Sea and elsewhere, and in other regions close to our borders. As for the Black Sea, this goes beyond that th certain threshold because this is just a matter of kilometers from our borders. And of course, we voice our concerns all the time and we talk about red lines at the same time, we do understand that our partners um, have a very special way of acting and um, a peculiar way and are somewhat superficial about the warnings they hear from us on the red lines. We do remember how NATO expanded to the east. We have a very professional audience here, despite the fact that Russia and uh, our Western partners, including the United States, had a very unique relationship that was close to an alliance. Our concerns and our warnings about NATO's eastward ex expansion were totally ignored. There were several waves of expansion, and now look where we find NATO's military infrastructure in the direct vicinity of our border. And in Poland and elsewhere, there are missile defense systems that can be easily used to launch offensive uh, missiles. Uh, this is a matter of just a few minutes just uh, to change and tweak the software. Nevertheless, our warnings have been yielding some result and did have some effect lately. So there is some tension in this regard. I wanted to point out two things in this regard. We need to keep up this pressure as long as possible so they do not have an idea of um, staging some conflict that we do not need along the, our border and we do not need anything of this kind along our borders. And we need 
to ensure that Russia gets serious, lasting guarantees of its security. After all, we cannot keep on worrying all the time what will happen. Of course, I can see that even despite the fact that you are wearing masks, I can see in your eyes some skepticism and some skeptic smiles whether we can expect any serious agreements in this regard. We are dealing with, to say the least, uh, very unreliable partners. They easily give up on the previous arrangement, but no matter how challenging, we need to work on this, and I ask you to work on this. We also see very clearly that uh, the Western countries uh, have used the situation in Belarus as a new pretext for tension along our borders. At the same time, they forget and turn a blind eye to their own humanitarian obligations. Let's look what is happening on the borders. We all see what is happening on television. The first idea you have in mind is there are small children there, but they use water cannons and tear gas against them. At night, there are helicopters flying along the border. There are sirens. I remember 2014 very well when the Polish authorities are trying to stop uh, the law enforcement agencies of Ukraine under President Yanukovych and talked about the, uh, the fact that it is unacceptable to use these means against civilian population. Of course, we understand and we know that the situation in Belarus, despite the fact that it calmed down there, but we know that there are problems there and we are fully aware of this and we call for dialogue between the government and the opposition. As for Russia, we will always seek to further reinforce our ties and our integration with Belarus. We will work to implement all the programs that were adopted on our social and economic development within the Union State to coordinate our bank and lending and tax policies. Russia mediated an end to the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, but the recent firing incidents show that things have yet to calm down completely to ensure stability. Russia is very much relevant with its peacekeeping force in the region. Of course, Russia diplomacy can play a major role in settling the disputes between Azerbaijan and Armenia and restoring economic ties in the Caucasus and unblocking transport corridors. We have uh, created an interstate commission and it is up and running and there are very positive prospects in this regard. All countries in the region, including Russia, are interested in promoting a lasting settlement. In Afghanistan, uh, there is also serious challenges. Uh, while continuing our contacts with the Taliban, we need to rely on the expanded Troika and the Moscow format involving Afghanistan's neighbors in order to promote civilian peace and to restore order and to neutralize terrorism and drug trafficking. What is going on in Afghanistan shows that additional measures are needed along Russia's southern borders. We need to help Central Asian countries, our allies, who look up to Russia as a guarantor of their stability. We need to move in these directions in the future to prevent major refugee flaws and prevent terrorism from 
from spilling over from Afghanistan into our territory. We have talked about the trends in with the global centers of power shifting from the Euro-Atlantic region to Asia-Pacific. And in this connection, dear colleagues, we need to step up our cooperation with Asia-Pacific countries, keeping in mind our project to establish a greater Eurasian partnership as a single broad space of mutually beneficial economic, trade and humanitarian cooperation. We remain committed to working with our friends and partners in China. We have reached the unpre an un unprecedented level in our strategic partnership with China, and this relationship provides a model for interstate relations. Not everyone finds this to their liking, and they want to drive a wedge between China and Russia. We see this very well, and together with our Chinese colleagues, we will respond to all this by expanding our cooperation in politics and in other spheres in international stage. Russia has the same approach to India, another privileged partner. We want to step up our diverse cooperation. India is an independent and major center in a multipolar world and we share similar ideologies uh, to support stability and security in Asia Pacific. We also work with ASEAN. We need to further reinforce and improve the experience in productively working with ASEAN in politics, economics, in the social sector. We also need to work with our partners in Asia and including on the post-pandemic recovery, facilitating trade in goods and services, facilitating exchanges in technology and promoting humanitarian ties. Russia will always remain committed to settling the conflicts and crisis in the Middle East and helping stabilize the situation there. It is with our participation that we've been able to defeat international terrorism in Syria, preventing the collapse of this state. Together with Turkey and Iran within the Astana format, we launched a settlement process in Syria. The Russian diplomacy must further contribute to the normalization of relations between Syria and Arab countries and attracting international aid for improving the humanitarian situation in Syria, for improving the situation in the Middle East, it is essential that we promote the Israeli-Palestinian settlement. We need to work with all the parties to the Libyan conflict to enable them to find compromise. Our top priority is to promote friendly, pragmatic and ideology-free with all uh, relations with all countries in the Middle East. Russia will pay special attention to working with African countries in a comprehensive, mutually beneficial manner in these uh, in this view, in 2019, Sochi hosted the first Russia-Africa summit in 2017. The next meeting could be held in 2022. We're working on this as for Latin America and the Caribbean. Of course, we were always interested in working with this region and we are becoming increasingly interested. This includes supplying vaccines and treatments for treating COVID-19. We are working with a number of countries and very closely and there are more and more countries of this kind. We need to keep up this process. As for European affairs, we regret to note that there are fewer cooperation opportunities, even though the EU remains our biggest trading partner. We used to have fruitful cooperation with the EU, 
but there are very serious challenges at this stage. Uh, we continue to see sanctions coming from the EU and groundless accusations instead of uh, promoting our cooperation in all areas. We have to be mindful of the fact that we are neighbors and history teaches us that dividing lines in the continent do nothing good. Of course, Russia is interested in neighborly, constructive relations with the European countries, but it, it all depends on the ability of our partners to promote uh, equal and mutually beneficial cooperation. Relations with NATO are quite challenging, they are openly confrontational. NATO is bringing its infrastructure closer to our borders without hiding this. All the dialogue mechanisms have been broken down. Of course, we will respond in an adequate manner to all these developments. Brussels must understand that easing geopolitical tensions and then the interests of Europe in general, not just Russia, they all of a sudden expelled Russian diplomats from Brussels and then they are uh, dissatisfied with the fact that we expel their diplomats and then we close the NATO mission. If they want to work with us, if they don't want to work with us, well, we do not have this intention either. So if they want to work with us, why expel our diplomats without any reasons or grounds whatsoever? And this applies to Russia's relations with the United States. To a large extent, uh, these relations are essential for global stability and security. These relations are unsatisfactory. Diplomats in both countries face many restrictions. Uh, our embassies are understaffed and cannot do their work to promote bilateral relations. This results from the provocative line adopted by our American partners who started introducing various restrictions on Russian diplomats. They confiscated our property in violation of all the possible international rules and norms. There is the Vienna Convention and other instruments, and there is no civilized dialogue on this issue. Nevertheless, in June 2021, we had a summit with President Biden in Geneva. It opened up some opportunities for dialogue and for evening out this relationship. We need both sides to implement their agreements. Something has been done along these lines. This means that uh, uh, we can work together on cybersecurity and strategic stability. On many issues, our interests, our positions diverge, and we all know this, and sometimes these differences are major differences, but we're open to context, to exchange opinions, and to constructive dialogue. Colleagues, just the questions I've mentioned show that our diplomatic service has a major burden. You have to work in a very challenging environment and the government will do everything to help and provide social guarantees to its diplomatic workers. Something has been done in this regard in recent years. Two laws, framework laws, have been adopted on the status of Russian representatives in foreign countries. There is also a remuneration system that has been adopted. The headquarters of the foreign ministry has been expanded to include more staff. We will keep paying special attention to these matters and help the executive team of the foreign ministry implement its initiative. I would like to thank all foreign ministry employees for the quality work and their commitment. Wish you every success in taking this opportunity. I would like to 
extend my special gratitude to the Foreign Service veterans who cannot be present today here for the reasons we understand, and I would like to wish them good health and every success. Thank you very much. And that's all the news we have for you right now. For Community Public Radio, I'm Don DeBar in New York. Thanks for listening.